Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Hillary Fully Renner on the topic of public diplomacy. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, the CG Online podcast. My name is Dr. Andrew Thompson. I'm an adjunct assistant professor of political science at the University of Waterloo and senior fellow here at the Center for International Governance Innovation in Waterloo. Every week on the program, we're joined by an expert in global governance, international public policy, or some other aspect of international affairs. Today our guest is Hilary Fuller Renner, who is a public affairs officer with the U.S. Consulate Office in Toronto. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Hilary, could we begin, could you say just a little bit about what cultural diplomacy is or public diplomacy is and what the mandate of your office is? Um, so public diplomacy is um, the U.S. Um, Departments of State's efforts to try to explain um, U.S. foreign policy to um, foreign audiences. So we do that f through a variety of different ways. We engage with international media. We um, work um, with cultural and e educational exchange programs. Um, we exchange academics. Um, we work with other um, sort of non-governmental um, partners as well as business to try to explain foreign policy, U.S. foreign policy, to overseas audiences. And how is public diplomacy different than, say, state-to-state -state diplomacy? What is, what is the value added of it? So public diplomacy um, is what some people call the soft pow power kind of aspects right. of, of diplomatic um, relations. Um, so the, the Department of State, who I work for, um, we work in public diplomacy in a variety of, of different ways um, through lar very large programs that, that engage huge amounts of people, hundreds and thousands of people, um, you know, annually. So we have um, very signature exchange programs such as the Fulbright program right. um, where we bring professors and students um, to the United States and then send them to, to, to other countries throughout the globe. Um, there's also um, other exchange programs such as the Humphrey Fellows Program, which is a master's degree program in a variety of, of areas. Um, it's a one-year program. We also do educational, um, short-term educational exchange programs for um, youth um, and high school students in terms of, like we have a program called the Youth Ambassadors Program, which brings right. kids that are 16 to 19 years old to the United States for three weeks to learn about leadership, um, a lot of community development, um, practices. So as you can see there's just a huge sort of variety in, in the educational exchange program area but we also have um, short-term professional exchanges called the International Visitor Leadership Program um, and it's where we get you know we've had um, anywhere from you know a thousand to ten thousand people participate you know on an annual basis. Oh. Um, you know, one of the, the, the important parts of, of the exchange program is that time in the United States where they get to, you know, meet other people in their professional fields, um, whether it's government, whether it's private business, or whether it's, it's other sort of entities. They also go to cultural events. They also see, you know, basketball games. They go to a, you know, a regional hockey game or whatever. Right. You know, they, they go see the dance, see dance professionals. and in a city. So they really get to know the United States in, in another way that they may not um, ever have that chance to right. do. Um, they also sometimes stay with, with families as well or other sort of professionals in the field. So they get like a home stay. So people come back from, especially from the three-week program that I'm talking about, they come back with a whole, it's like a transformational sort of viewpoint of the United States. They may have always respected the United States. They may have always, you know, maybe they studied it or been, you know, in contact with with um, with U.S. professionals, but they never really understood it in their area right. um, that they're working in, in the way after that, you know, than before that exchange. So it's it's very transformational. We've had like 250 heads of state, you know, participate in our exchange wow. programs. Um, you know, senior leaders in government. So that's why we do it. It's that engaging sort of one-on-one, -on -one. Um, you know, those individuals who are going to matter to our foreign policy. But, but it's also um, those people then can go back and explain the United States to other people. Right. Um, their friends, their families, in their, in their work. 
And then when they, they become leaders on their own part, they, they understand and know the United States. Right. Now, President Obama has initiated this program, the 100,000 Strong Program. Can you say a little bit about that? The 100,000 Strong Program is President Obama's um, concept of bringing 100,000 people from we Western Hemisphere Affairs to the United States, has Western Hemisphere to the United States, and, um, and then sending 100,000 um, people from the United States, students, academics, and others to the Western Hemisphere. And so the idea is that um, there'll just be a lot more student mobility and students from the U.S. will understand and maybe go down for language training and Spanish and, and other um, sort of um, programs, but that they will better understand and be better be able to integrate and network with, um, you know, Western Hemisphere, Canada, and, and Latin American countries as well. And so um, right now, I think that um, in Canada, we're looking at what does that mean in terms of, of also, um, you know, it's the 20th anniversary of NAFTA. How right. does that all fit in? Is there ways that we can work with Canada on student exchanges um, that would be really beneficial for both governments? Um, you know, maybe help in areas where we both need and, and can, you know, combine efforts in, in certain, um, I don't know, technical sectors or information technology sectors or, or, right. or other things. Excellent. Now, I understand you're just beginning your posting here in Canada. Um, has anything surprised you uh, so far in terms of your, the public diplomacy you've done, uh, you know, either here or in some of your previous postings? I think I've been most surprised um, by the, you know, sort of that, that, that people think that the United States is very similar um, to Canada in a lot of ways. Um, I mean, I think that when I talked to my friends um, when I was moving up here to Toronto, they were, they were like, oh, it's going to be so easy for you because you're going to go to Canada and everything's the same. And it's going to be, you know, they all speak English and it's simple, you know, that there's joint kind of cultural attributes and everything. And I think that um, it's much different in terms of, you know, bringing your family up and, and trying to integrate into the society. And also, um, in terms of my work, um, I found that um, that there's less, uh, people are very welcoming and very oriented and, and very, you know, you can ask them to partner with you and they're, they're willing to do that. But I think in terms of, of trying to um, do big things um, and, and try to, to figure out ways to, to do larger projects, I think that's going to be harder than I thought it was. I mean, I okay. think that you would think, you, most diplomats who would come up to Canada would be like, well, there's a willing partner, that's, there's many different um, people that I can work with, it's going to be a simpler sort of trajectory to, to develop a project, to get a program going, but I think um, it's going to be more difficult than I thought okay. that it's going to be. And maybe building on this, of course, everything now is online with social media. How is the nature of public diplomacy changing as technology changes? So public diplomacy a number of years ago used to be um, students and individuals coming in to a auditorium or a library that the U.S consulate or embassy had overseas, um, and they would come in and listen to a public lecture. Um, they would um, come and check out books in that library. Um, that's how they would engage with U.S. diplomats. US, maybe U.S. diplomats were moderating a panel with speakers from the U.S. Um, you know, maybe they were leading a session, an English session um, in, in a library um, or an English school. Right now, um, you know, the Department of State um, is, is engaging with foreign audiences through social media, of course, in a variety of different ways. I mean, we have all of our embassy, um, you know, social media properties. We have websites. We have Facebook pages. We have Instagram. You know, we, we are on Twitter. But the strategy is very different for okay. what part of the world. I mean, it's, it very much differs in, in um, you know, what they're doing in Africa because of internet penetration is so little. Um, and people, you know, use their mobile phones and they, and they do, um, do activities through their mobile phones. So in, in Africa, um, you know, they're doing, they're using different types of 
social media properties that are not Facebook and Twitter, that are, there are other things. Right. And so they're engaging with SMS technology and, and things that we wouldn't necessarily do. This, we wouldn't do that in the United States or in Canada. Um, and so for, for that engagement, that online engagement, it, it, there's a lot of challenges because you're trying to provide a lot of content on a timely basis and a lot of the work that we do is, has to be cleared. There has to right. be um, someone looking at that policy issue. Um, it's also difficult to get you know, a statement about an important conference or um, an activity that has been done, you know, a diplomatic meeting or something um, quickly a right. lot of times. Um, so one of the one of the things we do a lot of is we publish speeches and we do a lot of the things that we used to do, but we do them online and, mm -hmm. and we try to get materials to foreign audiences quickly about things they care about. And is there an expectation that you know this is twenty four seven that it's you know there's you you always have to be feeding new new content and it has to be really current. Yeah, there's definitely that expectation that everything we do should be current. Um, we should have um, a quick statement or a tweet about something that's occurred. We should be engaged online. But one of the things about social media that's also diffi difficult is that as a diplomat in, you know, 25, 30 years ago, you went to receptions, you engaged people in speeches, um, you were a public individual. But now people are also, you know, they have social media accounts. Um, right. They have their own Twitter feed. And so that has been a challenge for the State Department because we have ambassadors and consul generals and you know other principal officers that have their own social media accounts and are engaging online, but it's a private engagement. People didn't get to know the U.S. ambassador because he or she was you know visiting um, you know a girls' school. They right. they might read a press release about that, but they didn't see pictures and photos. And so there's that mixture of the private and the public lives that I think is also difficult at times for you know our our diplomatic, you know our the State Department as well as the people who are involved right. in diplomatic service. Right. So. And is um, is the State Department engaging in public diplomacy all around the world? I mean, is this a core part of of the State Department's mandate? Yeah, so we have. Um, we have public diplomacy officers throughout all of our embassies and consulates. Um, you know, in all of our, I don't know how many, I, I, I don't know the total number now, right. but I know that in, in Africa when we were there, when I worked for the Bureau of African Affairs, there were 48 um, public diplomacy officers um, out in the field. And so uh, every, um, every bureau and every hemisphere that we're in, we have certain programs, signature programs, um, in terms of you know um, outreach programs that we do, exchange programs, English teaching, um, Education USA, which is our advising program to try to have um, students, international students, come to the United States to study. And so we just you know we have sort of this this I would say portfolio or, or suitcase full of programs, and then we tailor them depending on what region that we're we're in. So something that maybe really work really well in Latin America. Maybe we do it this way in, in Asia. Or maybe that engagement, um, that outreach program that works really well in Poland um, in terms of you know, public speaking and in terms of engaging high school students doesn't work that well in some place like Canada. So we, right. as public diplomacy officers, are always looking at that suitcase and seeing how it best fits that overall goal, which is to achieve, you know, to explain um, US foreign policy to, to um, foreign audiences. So, um, one of the things, one of the I think challenges we face in the world today is a lack of trust amongst people, you know, um, a lack of empathy. Um, is public diplomacy an effective tool for fostering empathy, perhaps amongst populations that have been quite uh, antagonistic towards each other? We do, public diplomacy does a lot of work with institutions throughout the world in things like conflict management, um, conflict resolution, um, in an area where um, there's been civic strife or um, 
you know, I don't know what you call, you know, sort of armed conflict. Right. Um, most of those countries, um, the embassy will have a, a very big program, maybe in conjunction with the United States Agency for International Development, on conflict resolution. They'll, you know, bring um, their resources, you know, their funding, um, uh, programmatic resources to send, you know, like I said, to send people and exchange programs to learn how to teach conflict resolution in their own countries, right. as well as to, to have conferences and workshops and try to do trainings within that country. So in terms of teaching empathy, um, I think, you know, our, we want to make sure that our core values are out there, um, you know, respect for, for human rights, you know, civic participation, um, right. democracy, freedom of speech. And all of those things, in certain ways, I think, teach empathy because you're, you're allowing for freedom, ex freedom, which is right. the most important value for us. Right. And it seems to me that when you engage in public diplomacy, you are, in a sense, playing the long game. That the um, there could be some immediate uh, dividends, uh, but you're also, I mean, speaking to people as you mentioned before, who will be leaders. 20 years down the road. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, it is definitely the long game because there's programs that you develop as a public diplomacy officer and you have no idea well, if they're going to be failures and successes in right. the, the two or three years that you're there. And I think, you know, um, a perfect example is something I was involved in in, in one of my past posts. We decided to work with um, the local, the Ministry of Education and the local um, uh, teacher training colleges to um, provide resources to, to English teachers. Right. And we, we, um, we thought that they, we, we decided that we were gonna call, be called young, you know, young learners um, resource centers. And, and it's kind of a funny word, but in, in that language, you know, that sort of, the translation was quite good. And um, we started one, and it was pretty successful. And, and then there was a request for another. And, and by the time that I left, there was three of those young um, learners resource centers. And now there's, there's eight. Wow. And supposedly in plans for you know, in a couple of more in a, in a pretty small country. So I, uh, my short-term objective was just to, to see if this idea worked and if it could be successful in that sort of immediate environment because we didn't want to spend too many of our resources. We didn't, we have limited budgets and we want right. to make sure that it's really useful um, to um, the government and to um, the objectives of the, our partners, our local partners, whether it would be, you know, sort of private institutions or whether they're government institutions. And, and we were, we were quite, you know, um, you know, happy about that, but it, but it does, you are when you're having someone sending someone on an exchange program when they're 32 years old and you know or or 35 or 38 um, or 28, you have no idea what they're going, what's going to happen to them, and, and what the what is the long term sort of um, what what's the long term benefit or dividend that you'll get out of of the exchange program because the exchange programs are are you know, can be extremely costly, um, you know, recruiting that person, um, sending them over to the United States, paying for all of their expenses for a three-week trip. Right. Um, and then um, all of the, the follow-up, because we also have an alumni program which tries to provide grants and other resources to those people who've been on our program. So the long game, the short term is very expensive. The long term, you know, may have great benefits, but, right. but who's, who's to know? Because it's it's difficult to know. Some people um, go on our exchange programs and become, you know, like I said, they become heads of state and ministers in their own countries. Others start amazing organizations, um, which you know provide you know a whole area where that country has never had any. You know, um, an example is we sent over an individual on fundraising. Um, there had never been any institutions that worked on fundraising um, for and worked with non-governmental organizations right. to learn how to, to, to fundraise. So we sent him over for, it was only a 10-day program. He started this institute. He trains and teaches um, people throughout um, Eastern Europe on fundraising. And it's been highly successful for hmm. pretty, pretty limited sort of um, investment on our part. But he's our best friend and he continues to 
every chance he has is to talk about how great the U.S. Embassy is and how great the U.S. is for sending him on this program. So. Right. Now, um, on that, one of the uh, things we face in Canada is that very few of our university students actually go abroad for a semester or uh, do part of their degree outside of, of Canada. Um, and the number is, is around 8%. Um, now, in the, in the U.S., it's much higher. Mm -hmm. um, how, how, do we explain, how do you explain um, how, you know, why, why it is much higher in the U.S.? I believe I've, I've heard it's, it's almost 30% of U.S. students go abroad for, um, for part of their education. I think, I think the reason that it's somewhat popular in the U.S. is there's very well-developed programs. Right. Um, you know, I, I, I wonder, like I said, since I've been here for three months, I really don't know, um, I couldn't say generally if it's this way, but I know that in the United States, every university, every college has an exchange program of, uh, where they bring out, when they, they don't just do individual exchanges, so someone who's going to, wants to study architecture, wants to go to a, a school in Scotland for a year right. to study architecture. They have programs where it's an, a whole year, but it's a group of programs from this group of students from the same program. So that's also somewhat of a safe environment that we do right. as well. So, you know, you, you'll have nine friends from school that, be, you'll, that you've been studying with and that you'll all go and then study, you know, architecture in, in, in Scotland or, you know, you know, Renaissance studies in, in Italy. Right. So the individual exchanges are really well developed. You know, they've been going on for years and years and years. Um, and also those sort of group exchanges where it's a whole program that then goes over together. I think it, I think that, that maybe the Canadian institutions need to look at what is, you know, what is the exchange program experience that they want to give to their right. students and how, how, can the, how can it help the overall academic experience of the student and then how can it um, function so that it, it allows more um, students from those countries to also come back to Canada. I right. mean, one of the, the things, as we all know, international education, education in the United States is a huge industry. Right. Um, and, you know, we, um, we have, you know, I would say one of the most robust programs in terms of, of trying to get students to come um, to the United States. We recruit throughout the world. We have Education USA um, centers, which I think I mentioned before. Right. You know, in, in all of our binational centers, there are our embassies, um, our consulates. You know, also function as as Education USA advisors, um, and we provide information to students about any, any their exchange um, experiences that they want to have. We we can put them in contact with professors. We can provide them financial information. We can provide them all sorts of, of resources as well. And then some countries, we actually give them scholarships. Oh, okay, fantastic. Yeah. So they might be looking at um, a university and they might say, well, I have everything but the airfare and some, you know, I need, I'm gonna need a little bit of money and I'm not sure I can afford this. And, and so we look at that student and, and we will also fund them, the State oh. Department was, through our, through a, it's sort of a private public partnership program. Right. called Opportunity Grants. Right. Um, earlier in the podcast, you mentioned the 20th anniversary of the NAFTA agreement uh, and that there could be some opportunities to, to do some public diplomacy around that particular anniversary. Um, are there some specific projects that you hope to work on over the course of the next three years while you're here in, in Canada? I. I'm not sure that there's specific projects related to NAFTA, but I think you know that's an important um, anniversary, 20 years of NAFTA. I have served in our um, embassy in Mexico, and I saw the actual benefits of NAFTA and the, the sort of um, incredible things that it did for economic growth in Mexico. And I, um, you know, I know that since I've been here, talking to academic organizations and think tanks. I think there's a lot of, of Canadians who are wondering about what is the next step? What, what's our next step for NAFTA? Right. What, is, what policy should we develop? How can we be part of that 
discussion, um, whether it's here in Ottawa or in, in Washington or in Mexico City, about you know next steps for NAFTA that will really benefit the three nations and and you know stimulate economic growth, sti stimulate that sort of North American integration, but also maybe look at you know areas of labor development and, and trade and economic um, partnership in terms of innovation, in terms right. of, of um, also facilitating the border, the, the cross-border um, uh, transportation and all of that kind of stuff. Um, final question. Um, do you get a much chance to travel across Canada? Um, I've done a little bit of traveling in Ontario, so part of what I'm, I, my, my uh, mission here is to, you know, have contacts with people throughout Ontario. So I've been to a number of different cities and, you know, it's something I've enjoyed and in the short time I'm here and I'm sure I'll do, be doing more of it, but uh, we want to get to know all the, the, you know, our partners and the academic institutions, the media organizations, think tanks, um, business, um, you know, that, and, and I think it's, it's fun to travel um, and to see different parts of Canada. And, I, and I've also, within Ontario, I've noticed huge differences right. just in the short period of time um, in terms of, of just sort of the development of, of the towns and the cities. And, and, you know, it's, I think that I, I'm hoping that I will um, be able to, to spend some of my time outside of Toronto Right. Toronto is is all engaging and, and a very large, there are lots of different contacts. Sure. I'm hoping that I'll be able to continue to do a lot of, of trips outside Toronto. Hillary, this has been absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for uh, for being on the show and best of luck with, with all of your endeavors. And thank you to our audience for, uh, for tuning in. You've been watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us online at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter. Um, Short-term professional exchanges called the International Visitor Leadership Program, um, and it's where we get, you know, we've had um, anywhere from, you know, a thousand to ten thousand people participate, you know, on an annual basis. Oh. Um, you know, one of the, the, the important parts of, of the exchange program is that time in the United States where they get to, you know, meet other people in their professional fields, um, whether it's government, whether it's private business, or whether it's, it's other sort of entities. They also go to cultural events. They also see, you know, basketball games. They go to a, you know, a regional hockey game or whatever, right. you know, they, they go to see the dance, see dance professionals. and. In a city, so they really get to know the United States and in, in, in global governance, international public policy, or some other aspect of international affairs. Today, our guest is Hilary Fuller Renner, who is a public affairs officer with the U.S. Consulate Office in Toronto. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Hilary. Could we begin? Could you say just a little bit about what cultural diplomacy is, or public diplomacy is, and what the mandate of your office is? Um, so public diplomacy is um, the U.S. Um, Departments of State's efforts to try to explain um, U.S. foreign policy to um, foreign audiences. So we do that f through a variety of different ways. We engage with international media. We um, work um, with cultural and educational exchange programs. Um, we exchange academics. Um, we work with other um, sort of non-governmental um, partners as well as business to try to explain foreign policy, U.S. foreign policy to overseas audiences. And how is public diplomacy different than say state-to-state -state diplomacy? What is, what is the value added of it? So public diplomacy um, is what some people call the soft pow power kind of aspects right. of, of diplomatic um, relations. Um, so the, the tarp Department of State, who I work for, um, we work in public diplomacy in a variety of, of different ways um, through lar very large programs that, that engage huge amounts of people, hundreds and thousands of people, um, you know, annually. So we have um, very significant.
Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Hilary Fully Renner on the topic of public diplomacy. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. My name is Dr. Andrew Thompson. I'm an adjunct assistant professor of political science at the University of Waterloo and senior fellow here at the Centre for International Governance Innovation in Waterloo. Every week on the program, we're joined by an expert in nature exchange programs such as the Fulbright program, right. um, where we bring professors and students um, to the United States and then send them to, to, to other countries throughout the globe. Um, there's also um, other exchange programs such as the Humphrey Fellows Program, which is a master's degree program in a variety of, of areas. Um, it's a one-year program. We also do educational, um, short-term educational exchange programs for um, youth um, and high school students in terms of like we have a program called the Youth Ambassadors Program which brings right. kids that are 16 to 19 years old to the United States for three weeks to learn about leadership, um, a lot of community development um, practices. So as you can see there's just a huge sort of variety in, in that educational exchange program area but we also have 